Assessing nutritional status. This will be an overview of the tools used for detecting malnutrition, uh, starting with screening for anemia. Mama Project has created and adapted tools to quickly and, uh, and accurately assess malnutrition in women and children. We'll start with anemia screening, then address screenings for safe motherhood, and finally address nutritional status in children. Screening for anemia with hemoglobin color scale. This is recommended when laboratory testing is not possible. It's indicated in populations with high levels of malnutrition, malaria, intestinal parasites, and high incidence of maternal mortality from blood loss. When you finish this section, you can watch the video describing the technique for screening for anemia with the color scale. <clears throat> we'll briefly mention it here that you clean the fingertip or heel with alcohol, you get a drop of blood, you apply to absorbent paper, block firmly, wait 30 seconds, compare to a chart, read in natural light. The results may be in between the color blocks, uh, but you're not trying uh, for uh, accuracy, you're trying for an estimate to uh, the nearest gram per deciliter. The normal ranges are there. Next, we'll talk about maternal anthropometric measurements as predictors of cephalopelvic disproportion in nulliparous women deciding whether to deliver her baby near a facility with surgical services. Now, these measurements um, are a guide. The, one of the biggest uh, problems in the uh, developing world is early marriages, early motherhood. Before girls are really done growing, uh, they may be married in their teens and even younger. Uh, child marriages are a huge problem. And the word needs to get out that girls should not start having babies until they themselves have finished growing. Uh, this is a very important message, not just for uh, <clears throat> the survival of the child, but the survival of the mother. When women are giving girls, are giving birth to babies before their pelvis has finished growing, uh, that is a very serious problem. But how can you quantify that? Well, uh, you can measure the girl. This is not usually done out in public, uh, but uh, this is a good time to have this sort of an exercise is when you call a, a get together of all the women and girls in the community, call it a day for the girls. Uh, no boys are allowed, no men, because women are not gonna talk about reproduction uh, in, in a mixed um, gender setting. So if you expect to have participation and discussion and have people really um, learn from the event, you need to uh, have it women only. Um, so what, how, how do you measure? What measurements do you take? Well, girls who haven't finished growing, who are stunted, uh, who are less than um, 150 cc's in height, are at higher risk. And the least risk is her own ideal genetic potential. Uh, so you measure her height. Measure the intertrochanteric space. And you can uh, estimate that or measure it quite nicely by uh, what they call the Breisky tool, uh, which helps to uh, measure from the trochanteric uh, prominence at the hip uh, from the right to the left, and that should be a greater than 27.5. If she's less than 27.5, she is at higher risk. She hasn't grown to her maximum yet. The lateral sacral rhomboid uh, is a prominence of the sacrum, which you can, you don't have to have the girl undressed. You, you can feel this right through her clothes. The uh, lateral aspect of the sacrum should be more than 9.5 less is higher risk. And actually, even her foot length uh, is important. Now, <clears throat> the foot length of 23 uh, is uh, considered a, a boundary for a, a small foot that hasn't finished growing. Now, you can also measure her mid upper arm circumference, just like you do the uh, mid-upper arm circumference of, um, of children between a year and, uh, and five years, 12 to 60 months usually. But the, the risk for the mother or the potential mother 
of having intrauterine growth retardation and associated high risk of poor immune function and poor intellectual development in the child, um, that correlates with the, the mother's weight and her arm circumference before pregnancy. So the mid-upper arm circumference of uh, less than 23 says that girl's not ready for safe motherhood yet. She needs a little more time. She needs to grow a little bit more. Uh, and greater than 23 is associated with less risk. And uh, as in, every, uh, in everything that we're measuring, it is best for her to grow to her own ideal genetic potential. Now, the level of anemia associated with higher risk of maternal mortality in pregnancy and postpartum. Severe risk is a hemoglobin under 8. Moderate risk is 8 to 10. Mild risk is 10 to 12. And low risk is no anemia. Now, when you're having your uh, days for girls, there are many things that, uh, that you can talk about. Safe motherhood topics that apply to all cultures. Uh, it, number one is the need for support from family, friends, and community. It's important to stress that child health begins before birth. Um, mother's health also starts before her own birth. She, in order to have, be the healthiest possible mother, has to start out, start out as the healthiest possible baby. It's, goes from generation to generation. Talking about motherhood in the community, people can tell personal stories um, in, the, in your family of origin. How did you learn about puberty, menstruation, sexuality, pregnancy, delivery, and caring for babies? And number six, how are young people learning now? Are they learning enough? Do they have enough support, enough education? Uh, number seven, can you share your own experiences with puberty, pregnancy, birth? Um, in your community, do, go, do women go to the hospital? Are husbands involved? Are there midwives active in the community? How about doulas? Uh, who supports the women through labor and delivery? Number nine, how do women decide where to deliver? Number 10, how do they arrange transportation, housing, childcare? And what number 11, what are women taught about feeding their children so that they have the best chance of being healthy adults and parents? Are there food taboos for babies, toddlers, youth, menstruating girls, pregnant women, nursing moms, and women in childbearing years? Uh, many of those food taboos restrict the women and children who are most in need of the best, most uh, enriched, rich food uh, to grow to their maximum, are the, are, those are the foods that are often uh, included in the taboos, things that people think are harmful in pregnancy. No nutritious food should be pro prohibited. But who teaches her? Who is the source of information? How to assess the risk for pregnancy complications in young girls? Measurements, uh, as we talked about before. Measure messages to share. Girls should postpone childbearing until their bodies are fully grown. The entire community, including friends, relatives, and the fathers of the babies, need to support the future mothers to postpone childbirth and plan healthy spacing of pregnancies for the health of the entire family. Men and boys need special events also for males only to discuss healthy male roles in relationships, fatherhood, and family life. And focus groups on safe motherhood, number of questions to ask. When should we start thinking about the girl getting the right foods to prepare her body for motherhood? Uh, getting the first menstrual period, how much did you understand? Who taught you? Who's teaching girls now? Who's teaching boys? Measurements, uh, how to know if a girl has grown enough physically? Uh, how to decide when and where to have children? Who is with her in her labor? What's taboo um, for the women and children? Are there customs that surround pregnancy and childbirth that are helpful and comforting? Is there folklore? Uh, this gets people really talking and having a good time telling uh, what they were told they should and shouldn't do in pregnancy. Are there dangerous customs? Is there a fear of curses or evil forces that could harm the mother or child? And are there new options or treatments that help the mother and child? <clears throat> Children who good Get good care and nutrition, grow well. Children who are hungry for food and attention fail to grow.
There are times that you only need your eyes to tell you that a child is malnourished. To document mild and moderate malnutrition, it is necessary to measure children. Detecting and classification of malnutrition reveals if a child is malnourished and how badly, and is if a community has a problem with food security and how badly is the population suffering. Parents, community members, and government agencies need to know how the children are growing. But how do we know what is normal? Are children being compared to children from developed countries? Nope, not anymore. New 2005 and 2007 international growth standards have been established by measuring children from every race and nationality to see how they grow. The World Health Organization child growth standards now apply to children from birth to 19 years of age regardless of race, ethnicity, nationality, every country, every continent, they're international. Measurements are used to classify children as normal, moderately, or severely malnourished according to growth charts. Now, uh, we must realize that a child may be technically normal, but truly malnourished for their own personal genetic potential. These growth standards are generous. So if a child is declared as moderately or severely malnourished, that is uh, believable. These are the job aid weighing and measuring uh, charts and instructions for from the World Health Organization. Uh, the video that you will have an opportunity to look at at the end of this uh, gives you all of that information. If you can't get the video to play, uh, you can always come back to these pages, pause them, and read the instructions. These, lap, uh, these infantometers, stadiometers, <coughs> infantometers and stadiometers are heavy and difficult to carry, so it's harder to use them in brigades and portable activities, um, and mobile activities, house calls, etc. Um, but these are what is used around the world. We, we like our, the tools that we've invented because we've made them to be portable. Standing height has to be done accurately. Take the shoes off, make sure the child is uh, postured correctly. Growth charts can be confusing and time consuming. So Mama Project has created easy to use tables based on the new growth standards. Um, they're not enough. We also need to put the information into computer programs uh, to analyze the ch children's growth uh, much more precisely compared to the norms. Uh, but for the, um, to be able to tell the mother right away if her child is um, normal or mild or moderately malnourished, it's a, a useful tool. MAMA Project's tables aid rapid field assessment of children. The tools of the health flagpole and the laugh infrontometer facilitate accurate measurements. The nutrition ruler is a useful tool uh, for malnutrition in 12 to 60 month old children and women of childbearing age. But uh, it is useful between 12 and 60 months, healthy children have a mid upper arm circumference above 14 centimeters. Below 12.5 centimeters, a child of that age may be severely malnourished. Um, but that's become a bit controversial. Women of childbearing age should have a mid upper arm circumference over 23 centimeters. The MUAC controversy. The MUAC mid upper arm circumference cutoff for severe acute malnutrition has been debated recently. It does not appear to be a sensitive enough indicator as would be desired for a screening tool to be used in the community setting. It's easy to use, portable, cheap, but perhaps is most useful for monitoring recovery than for detection. Proposed cutoff points have ranged any for acute severe malnutrition wasting have ranged from 11 centimeters 
to 12.8 and sometimes higher. Um, it is not sensitive enough. It is much better to know the weight for height uh, to see if a child is wasted um, and the um, too many children are missed if you rely just on the mid upper arm So the questions that we want to answer with all this measurement that we're doing is this child or adult well nourished or is he she in need of attention? Is his or her degree of malnutrition moderate or severe? Is he or she getting better? Our tools can give us answers starting with the tables. If we want to know, is this child too short? Is this child too thin? First, we need to know their age, exact age in years and months. That can be a problem. Their weight in kilograms to 0.1 kilogram, uh, meaning 10 uh, gram, 100 grams. A height in centimeters to 0.1 centimeter, in other words, to the millimeter, and the presence or absence of edema. If we don't have an age, uh, then we lose a lot of information. It's very important for people to record children's ages. Uh, in some places, they don't record the age because they feel uh, fear that that will um, tantalize the evil spirits uh, if they find them gloating over how old the children are getting. Uh, they might uh, seek to uh, harm them. So some, some groups don't want to celebrate the age of the children. But it is important to know the age uh, if we're trying to assess their growth. Um, there, you can look at their teeth. You can, you can try to understand if they were born before or after some event, some festival or, or community event. Birth date is really irreplaceable. There's five tables. Look at them as we read. Height for age. This is really the most important chart, the two charts. Um, the height is the biggest indicator of the chronic health of the community. Uh, if we're looking for one thing to measure as how, how is this community doing, we want to know what's the, how are the children under age five growing? Are they growing as they should. But you'll notice that we care about the children all the way up to their 19th birthday. They are still children. And their, their uh, chance of catch-up growth uh, will, will end when their epiphyses close. Uh, so it is important to not just think of the children who are uh, infants and toddlers and preschool age now, but the children who've been malnourished um, and are now perhaps school age, adolescents, teenagers, and they have a time for catch-up growth. Uh, so we should not neglect those children. The weight for age is um, important. Weight for height for the zero to five after the BMI. And uh, there's also a chart for ideal uh, BMI for women in childbearing years. BMI for age after five uh, years old, after the fifth birthday from five to 19, we think of BMI. The tables all follow the same pattern. Green is normal, yellow is moderate, and red is severe malnutrition of whatever indicator you're looking at, be it height or weight or BMI. Now, uh, time to practice. Gather your tools. If you have the, uh, the access to an infantometer, a stadiometer, armbands, the charts, um, if you don't have actual um, stadiometer and infantometer, at least use metric tape uh, for practice. Read the instruction sheets. Play the section again if you need. Practice on healthy children or malnourished children, dolls, or pretend children paper children. Uh, and then the, here's a here's a few um, boys and girls. Go ahead and you can tell if these children are malnourished, normal, and 
I will study this and do it later. Beware of water weight. When a child is so sick that he or she is swollen up with water, he or she will be heavier, making him or her look healthy on paper only. Sometimes a mother thinks that this child is um, healthy because he's looking plump. And when he starts to go to, into rehabilitation, he'll lose some of that water weight, he or she, and start to look more uh, wasted to the mother. The child is actually a child who is very wasted to begin with, but swollen up with water. Uh, and there are times when uh, the mother is alarmed that the child is um, is wasting away before her eyes as they as their edema is being mobilized. Uh, always look at the child and check for edema. Any child in a setting where there's malnutrition as a public health problem, any child who is swollen with water should be considered severely malnourished. There are other causes that children swell, like uh, acute glomerulonephritis, kidney problems, but that is not very common. Uh, whereas in, if, in the communities that have a, a problem, public health problem of malnutrition, chronic or acute, edema is usually associated with malnutrition. So, um, when not to believe your charts, but to believe your eyes. Uh, if you have indication of severe malnutrition, acute, no matter what the weight shows, if you see a child with quashiorcor, core, uh, that indicates protein deficiency and other nutrient deficiency. Study the pictures and learn to detect edema in the feet. If you have a child with marasma, the wasting, that in indicates total calorie deficit, wasted arms and legs, especially blow to belly, and a protein deficiency can cause swelling and may falsely elevate the weight. So you can't just look at the charts, you must look at the child. Uh, next, we're going to windows of achievement. As children are developing normally, they should pass the motor milestones on schedule. Um, in many communities, malnutrition is a common cause for physiological, social, and motor uh, delay. Uh, the next chart is, uh, the next slide is a chart showing no, normal motor milestones, sitting, standing, crawling, walking for children over four months. Delay may be caused by malnutrition or not enough social stimulation or attention, or it could be from a neurological or brain disorder. Uh, when feasible, it is good to assess all children in designated age ranges. It's usually not possible to do that in the event of a, in the, setting of an event that's uh, open to the entire community. But if time allows, and if you're taking care of children, for example, in a daycare or some sort of a center, uh, a preschool, if uh, it is good to ask the mother about the child's development and, and uh, better yet to observe them for yourself. Sometimes the mother um, wants to think that the child is um, doing fine and doesn't, uh, seem um, doesn't doesn't report or acknowledge a developmental delay. So it's best if you have a chance um, to assess the motor milestones by observing the child yourself. Uh, norms are included uh, <clears throat> for when you do have time to have prolonged enough contact with a child to assess them individually. This is the range ranges, they're very generous. Um, we would be really concerned about a child who's 17 to 18 months and not walking yet, um, but that uh, is considered within the, within the range that we can't uh, diagnose a developmental delay. Uh, these are some other little ask the mother and, and it may congratulate her when she, the child is doing well. For disabled village children, children with developmental delays have special needs for support to achieve their maximum potential. The Hesperian Foundation has an excellent book called Disabled Village Children. Anyone interested in health information geared to communities with scarce health care resources should become familiar with the Hesperian Foundation. Check out their website. They have amazing um, books. Uh, they uh, or, or a nonprofit 
Uh, they, um, you can buy their books or you, you can get them donated uh, for um, resource poor settings, but uh, they are worthy of donations. Uh, work logs and encounter records. In field work, you would, recording you would be recording data on paper and into the computer. So uh, fill out your papers neatly and completely. Uh, what does all of this do for the children? Malnourished children need special counseling. Counsel the mother. Explain all the findings. Listen to her concerns. Be kind, compassionate, respectful, and affirming. Um, sometimes the women that you're meeting who are bringing their children to a, an encounter, a, a child health day or a medical brigade, many times they are the, uh, the victims of, of a lot of injustice directed toward women. They're used to not being treated with respect. Um, they're, they're women who need to be affirmed and need to be respected. Um, the job that they're that they're doing in difficult circumstances needs to be acknowledged. Um, if people who were raised with many more opportunities had to uh, move into their shoes and raise children in those um, circumstances, our respect for them and the job they're doing would be likely to rise. So, in, uh, treat these women with respect, and the men, and the elderly, and the children. Share basic nutrition and hygiene messages, um, but share the messages not as criticism, but as information that has helped you in your life, and you would like to share that information with them. Uh, see the section on health messages. Remember to share the community, uh, to the information with community health leaders. In every community, there are people who are looking after the, their uh, fellow neighbors and the children. They may not always even be designated as community health workers, but they're the people that show up, they talk to you, they have questions, they want to, they maybe bring some families in and are expressing concern to you. Um, it's good over time uh, to connect with those people, ask them questions, find out what life is like, ask them what the problems are in the community in formal and, in, and informal uh, venues, it is important to connect with the, with the people. Whenever possible, plan a focus group at the end of the day with the community leaders just to talk about their concerns, our concerns, our questions. Uh, it, a lot of what you want to do when you're in the community is build bridges and build friendship. Now, begin nutritional rehabilitation with care. Um, if you haven't already gone over the uh, sections on the refeeding syndrome um, and nutritional rehabilitation, uh, do so now and be sure to um, be very mindful of the dangers of the refeeding syndrome if you are over aggressive and impulsive and impetuous in giving too much food too soon. That's very dangerous. Uh, those who wish to have a summary of the emergency um, hospital care of children in hospital care of children in resource limited settings may find this book extremely valuable. It can be purchased online on the WHO website, um, but we've also included it in PDF form uh, in the materials that you may want to uh, print off. Um, chapters 7 and 10 are recommended. These can be downloaded uh, online or um, as a PDF. Um, using the multiple, uh, the multivitamin and mineral supplement for home food fortification, um, use whatever readily available, highly nutritious food that you can encourage the uh, mother to use for her child. Nutritious foods such as eggs and red palm oil should be consumed as, uh, by every woman and child. Alternatives include soy, milk, meat, mixed grains, ground nuts. A severely malnourished child needs uh, Two such supplementary feedings and a severely child, a severely malnourished child needs three. Now those are rough guidelines. However, if you have a, an ability, a, a clinic that is um, stationary that you can be seeing the child 
regularly and giving them uh, nutritional food supplements according to their weight, according to the recommendations in the IMCI book, that is better yet, systematic, ongoing nutritional rehabilitation in the community. Uh, follow the, the guidelines. But at the very least, um, you, you should think of two or three supplementary uh, feedings per day. The Humber Project promotes the strategy of food fortification with a balanced formula of micronutrients that contain all of the 21 essential micronutrients. That can be added to food at, at home, in the school, in orphanages, feeding programs, hospitals. How much? One level mini scoop for every child six to 12 months who is uh, not who, as they're weaning from breastfeeding and starting to eat complementary foods. If the mother is getting the micronutrient and she's breastfeeding the child, the child under age six months does not need the supplementary micronutrients. Um, an important message here too for malnourished infants is skip the weaning food. Many times the children uh, fall into malnutrition when they start weaning from the breast because they're weaned to a very unnutritious starchy gruel um, made of whatever starch is most available. Um, and that uh, is a very, very serious problem. Weaning to the food that the family is eating, little at a time introducing the food that is on the family table, uh, sweet potatoes, fruits, um, vegetables, anything that the family's eating, eggs, meat, milk, cheese, Whatever is available to the rest of the family, the baby should start uh, weaning to those foods, not to a, a gruel of sugar and starch. Uh, a child from one to two years, um, one, one to 12 years, 12 months to 12 years, should have two level 0.15 mini scoops um, for their, uh, added to their food every day. And over 12 and all adults, including pregnant and nursing mothers, three 0.15 cc mini scoops. Everyone in the family needs vitamins and minerals. Ending hunger is everyone's business. What follows is a more detailed explanation of the tables and the graphs, interpreting the tables, understanding malnutrition classification, grasping, grasping the concepts of graphs and z-scores, uh, what is coming up next is not necessarily of interest to everybody. Um, it doesn't hurt to go through it, but don't feel that everybody who participates in a brigade is going to have to grasp all this. And we don't have people sitting using charts and graphing. Um, we do that in the computer and we use the, ta the rapid assessment charts um, for immediate assessment. We do put the anthropometrics of the child into an anthropometric calculator just to get the z-scores, but we don't, uh, we don't graph. So here we go. We'll go through it quickly. Um, it'll be review for some people. It'll be new information for others, um, but don't get scared by it. What do you learn from the tables? Weight for age, height for age, weight for height, BMI for age. If a child is stunted, they are uh, short in length or height. If they're underweight, they're low weight. If they're wasted, they're low weight for height. If an adolescent is stunted, they're low height. An adolescent is underweight, they're low BMI. Chronic malnutrition. Uh, both moderately and severely malnourished children are at great risk of death and disease. Stunted children, even teenagers, need extra food for catch-up growth for productive adulthood and safer motherhood. Now, it takes a long time to get stunted. Height indicates chronic long-term nutrition. Knowing a child's height helps us to know whether they have grown as well as expected over time. Have they been well-fed during their lifetime? Or have they been stunted by years of undernutrition? If they are in the yellow range, they're classified as moderately chronically malnourished. In the red, they're severely chronically malnourished. Acute malnutrition. Both moderately and severely malnourished children need to recuperate or they will be at risk, great risk of death and disease. Children who become malnourished due to illness need extra food to regain lost weight 
and prevent growth stunting. It takes a short time to become wasted. A child can become skinny in a very uh, short time with a bad illness. Height indicates chronic long-term malnutrition. Weight indicates short-term nutrition. Knowing the child's weight can tell you if they are malnourished right now because of the current level of nutrition. Are they being well-fed at the present time? If they're in the yellow range, they're moderately acutely malnourished. Red indicates severe acute. Weight for height from birth to age five. After that, you do BMI. Are they wasted for their height? Especially helpful if there's no accurate. BMI for age is an assessment of whether the body weight is appropriate for their height at their age. BMI, you can't measure it directly, but you can use a table or a calculator to estimate. Um, and you can also sit down with your pen and paper and get your weight in kilos divided by their height in meters times their height in meters. Um, you can use a BMI wheel or a computer. Now, BMI graphing, we need to know both the height and the weight to calculate the BMI, an index of body heaviness compared to the height. The normal BMI varies greatly with age, so the exact age is important. If it's unknown, the weight for height can be helpful until age five. But the timing of puberty is so variable and the body shape and composition will change at variable rates depending on the onset of sexual maturity. One of the best indicators of overall health of the community is how well the young children are growing. Adversity in the local economy, war, famine, crop failures, natural disasters, and injustice all impact the growth of the So um, information on children's growth guides, care for each child, um, computer, uh, computers can and it provide data for statistics, health workers and village volunteers care for the uh, individual child and the community use. Now, those of you who want to understand the growth charts and the Z scores continue. We use the X, or the y, the, the X and the Y axis. The X and the Y are always labeled, example, for height, age, or weight. Um, after we find our values, example, age and weight, we draw two straight lines perpendicular to the axes and where they the lines will, will match where they you get your Z score. Our Z scores. That, uh, we are now look, going to look at some graphs to see how they're used to develop to determine whether or not a child is malnourished. We we'll use the boys' age zero to five weight graph as an illustration. The same principles apply to all of the graphs. When children are weighed, they usually gain weight as time passes. When researchers graph the weight compared to the age, the most common weight is represented by the line marked zero. A child whose weight for his age falls and that line gets a score of zero. There are zero they are zero distance from the middle of normal, the most frequent weight for the age. The next slide, the zero will be darkened. The zero, the line going from birth up to five years, the darkest one is the average age. Boys whose weight for their age fall between the zero, also called zero z-score line, and two, the two z-score are higher weight than most of the common, but still normal. That's illustrated. Okay, those little boys are, are heavier than the average, but they're still normal. Boys whose weight is below the middle of their age group, zero z-score, but above the minus two line, minus two z-score, are also normal, but below the most common. That's illustrated by the green shading. And you can see that the boys in the green are lower than normal, but they're still lower than average, but they're still normal. If a boy's weight for his age falls in the area between score, and minus two z-score, he is normal. That's the two shaded green. The, the two z-score line and the minus two z-score line are the boundary between normal weight for age and either overweight or underweight. Children who are mildly malnourished may fall in the area between zero and two because minus two because they have fallen below the weight they could have achieved if they had been well fed. They, they've fallen below their own genetic potential, but they're technically not abnormal. 
red area between 2z score and 3z score represents overweight and between minus 2z score and minus 3z score represents a moderate degree of underweight moderate malnutrition that's the red there if a child's weight for age is above the 3z score he is obese and if below the minus 3 Z score, he is severely underweight. This is an emergency. Use rulers or a different straight edge uh, to line up the two values carefully so your conclusions are accurate. Make sure all the lines are perpendicular. Um, for the remaining slides, I'm not going to record audio. Uh, we'll just pause for a few seconds on each slide. And those who want to uh, can come back later uh, and pause the slides uh, to get a, a, a opportunity to study them in detail.